Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, colleagues, friends, dear Mrs. Stelzenmüller, this was a very kind introduction. And I can assure you there will be no strategic surprise in the next days. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I'm fine in my job, and we will win the next elections, and then there will be the next Minister of Defense as well, and in five or six years' time we can discuss something else, but not now. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, our topic today is the future role of Germany in the international security arena. But before we discuss the future role of Germany, we should take a few minutes to think about its role today. Where does Germany stand today? The discussions were engaged in, together with Hillary Clinton, Leon Panetta, Philip Hammond, Sergei Lavrov and other colleagues at the Munich Security Conference the other day. They all are painting a good picture of the security environment we live in. We discussed the situation on Iran, the way we are dealing with the financial crisis, the U.S. shift in strategy, and the issue on the re resolution on Syria. The conclusions drawn by an observer of the conference were not very flattering, neither for us Europeans nor for the United States of America and even less for Russia. I quote, the U.S. dictates, Russia blocks, and Europe debates, unquote. Australia's foreign minister, Kevin Rudd, was also unusually clear when he described the European role. I quote, the danger that I see is Europe progressively becoming so introspect introspective that Europe runs the risk of talking itself into an early economic and therefore globally political grave. Europe has fundamental strength, but we are not seeing a whole lot of that right now." Unquote. Is that true? Is Europe a powerless debating club? And are the US, Russia, and China relapsing into old patterns of mistrust? These are questions we must address openly when thinking about Germany's future role. Before we discuss, we are going, we should, uh, before we discuss where we are going, we should first be asking one more question, where are we coming from? For a long time, simply raising the question of a military role for Germany, let alone of re German responsibility in international security, would have been tantamount to breaking a, um, a taboo. With regard to our past, it was neither expected nor desired, and maybe even feared, that Germany of all countries take over a leadership role. Even in Germany itself, a leadership role of any kind was strongly rejected by most people. At the beginning of the 90s, Eberhard Jeckel, a famous German historian, wrote an interesting article about the role of the reunited Germany. He compares the situation of Germany one year after reunification with the beginnings of the so-called German Reich 120 years before. Especially with regard to the perception of European neighbors, there may be some similarities to today. On March, uh, on the 30th March uh, 1871, the German Reichstag stated with self-assurance that, I quote, the German satisfaction, the European security lacked the unity of the German Reich, unquote. Benjamin Disraeli, the then leading representative of the British Conservative Party, had a slightly different opinion. 
Already in April 800, uh, 1848, the Israeli warned, I quote, one must withstand the beginnings of Germany's liberation policy, that dreamy and dangerous nonsense called German nationality in the interests of European peace, unquote. More than 100 years later, one of Israeli's great conservative successors, Margaret Thatcher, will be accredited to have said, you know, the sentence, to be true, it's not from her, but it's, uh, she could have said that. We love Germany so much that we would prefer to have two of them. <laughs> when analyzing the German foreign policy from Bismarck to Hitler, Professor Jekyll concludes, I quote, being afraid of one's own strength must be a principle of German politics. Being afraid of Germans' own strength must be a principle of German politics, unquote. This is from, this is uh, 20 years ago, not 120 years ago. Being afraid of one's own strength was also a convenient reason and sometimes even an excuse for German restraint when it came to making specific German security policy contributions. The fear of our own strength had an impact on our notion of the term alliance too. Frankly, until the unification, the majority of Germans thought that alliance meant, first and foremost, foremost that Germany was benefiting from the security guarantee of our friends and partners. True to the motto, motto, we take a lot, we give little. We must not ignore completely, however, and this is a serious point, that if deterrence had failed, Germany would have been the geographic region most affected. I would like to state just as frankly, many of our allies were just as satisfied with the strong economic role played by Germany as with, as with its weak role in international security. Reference was sometimes made to Germany being an economic giant and a security dwarf. All of this is over now, even though these ideas may still linger in some people's mind. Many of our partners have long since regarded us as an equal partner with the same rights, but also with same obligations. I want to make very clear, fear of one own strength is no guiding principle in German politics. Fear is never a good guiding principle, by the way. More adequate is respect and responsibility within the alliance and without forgetting our past. It is our ambition and, this, and also an expectation placed on us by our partners that Germany assume responsibility for its own security and contribute to the security of its partners. As the most populous country, the string, strongest economy in Europe, and the second largest or third largest exporting nation in the world, we are particularly dependent on international stability. For a long time, however, we have already been making a significant contribution to stability ourselves. Since the, the reunification, since Germany regained its full sovereignty, our country has come a long way at a great pace. We are already shouldering more international responsibility that we can convey to some of our citizens. Mindsets trend to evolve more slowly than circumstances. Today, more than 7,000 German servicemen and women are serving on three continents. Just to give you an example, while we are sitting here, there are 1,200 Canadian soldiers all over the world. More than 300,000 German troops 
have been on deployment since 1991. For 10 years now, we have been engaged in Afghanistan, where we are the third largest troop contributor. Aside from the US, Germany is the only no nation to assume a leading role in Afghanistan as lead nation in the northern part of the country. Troops from more than 18 countries, including 4,000 US troops, are under our command, and it works perfect. In Kosovo, Germany is providing the commander K4 for the third time in a row. We are among the largest troop contributing nations in Kosovo too. We have been involved in operations in the Balkans for 20 years. We have been contributing ships and maritime patrol aircraft for the European Union's counter piracy operation Atalanta. From the very out outset, Germany is assuming leadership responsibility in this operation as well, and I would add more than others. The German armed forces are able to fight and they are able to take the lead. We do not need to hide our light under a bushel. We Germans in particular know that we are only as strong as the alliances which we are a part of. But the reserve is also true. For Germany, the North Atlantic Alliance will continue to be the most important security alliance. It will remain at the core of German security policy. It lies in our own interest to strengthen NATO and to develop it further. And it lies in the best interest of the United States of America to rely on NATO. To that end, a fair burden sharing within the alliance is indispensable. The expectation by our American partners of a greater European share of responsibility will become more urgent in light of the restructuring of the US military. Economically speaking, Europe is a global part player. After all, its share of global GDP has nearly reached 25%. With nearly 500 million inhabitants, Europe has demographic clout. As a role model for regional in integration, it brings to bear a high degree of international recognition and political credibility also with new major players such as India, Brazil, South Africa, amongst others. Yet, US Defense Secretary Robert Gates sent out a very clear message to the European NATO partners in his farewell address delivered in Brussels last June. He particularly criticized Europe, Europe's commitment in the field of security policy. He even addressed the risk of a collective military irrelevance. This call for a militarily and economically strong Europe, by the way, is not new. US Defense Secretary McNamara criticized 1962, I quote, the European NATO states were doing too little. They harbored useless nuclear ambitions instead of providing men, tanks, and cannons to close the gaps at the NATO front, which were still yawning despite binding NATO planning figures." Unquote. America's appeal to the Europeans, and I quote now John F. Kennedy in the same year, to, do, to uh, no longer simply look on, but to play a role in this great international struggle is as topical as ever, but it is historically unique. It's not historically unique. We have been discussing the issue of burden sharing in slightly lamenting tones on both sides of the Atlantic for as long as NATO exists. This is no doubt, there is no doubt. NATO's entire history is a success story but it was at all times marked by discussions about the allegedly dreadful crisis that NATO was facing. Every time 
You can read articles and have, can hear speeches about the crisis of NATO. And in the end, it was successful. The United States, too, are in a process of restructuring their armed forces. They have to save money, too. The United States are setting priorities in their strategic guidance with regard to their geostrategic location between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans and with consideration of their economic interests and ties. We Europeans have to get accustomed to a simple truth. The United States will no, no longer pull our chestnuts out of the fire all the time. Awareness of this fact is growing slowly, even in Germany. Europe will have to assume even more responsibility for security in Europe and in its immediate neighborhood in the future. Against this backdrop, the restructuring of the US military might represent an opportunity for Europe. The withdrawal of US combat brigades from Europe offers no reason for complaint for me as the German Minister of Defense. And I made this quite clear yesterday with my talks with Leon Panetta, and we made it together quite clear on a common press conference. Firstly, many US troops will stay in Germany, more than 40,000. Every single one of them is welcome in our country. Europe will continue to be the largest and strategic, strategically most important location for US troops stationed abroad. And this is the case especially for Germany. Secondly, the intended transition from quantity to quality, a new capability, uh, capability profile comes as no surprise. We are doing exactly the same in Germany. I cannot close down bases in Germany and reproach the United States for doing the same thing in the US as long as it is done with consideration and moderation, and it was. The increased US focus on other regions of the world is, by the way, also a result of many years of lasting peace in Europe. It is also a response to the success to Europe, of Europe. Moreover, it is an indication of the trust which the Americans place in us in their European partners. If we do not want to betray this trust, if we want to safeguard our own interests, and if we want Europe to make its voice heard in the world, including in the field of security policy, then we will have to bring more influence to bear. Europe must be able to shoulder military responsibility for its own security and for the security of its immediate neighbors. Europe must and Europe shall assume responsibility. I add very seriously responsibility within NATO. I would prefer strengthening the European voice in NATO to the attempt of forging a European security alliance in duplication. We should first of all honor the pledges we have made so far before announcing new institutional steps to be taken within the European Union. Europe's armed forces must become more effective. They must become more sustainable. And it must be possible to plan and to exercise command and control at the European level complementary to NATO. To put it in a nutshell, we must be able to do more and we must be able to do more together, and we must be able to do more together within NATO. Germany will continue to make a significant contribution in this endeavor, and it will take the lead whenever necessary. NATO allies will reaffirm their commitment to the NATO summit in Chicago in May. So what do the challenges we are now facing together look like? I remember a political cartoon in the Atlantic Times in which a Chinese swordsman points his weapon 
at an American baseball player. The caption below read, whose century? The US and China compete for supremacy in the Asia Pacific. But does it really exist? A European, American, or Asian century? I don't think so. First of all, our century is only just 12 years old. And there, is, there are more players than America and China. I don't think ever there was an European, Asian, African, or whatever century in the world. On the same page, there is an article entitled Wanted Leadership, complaining that, I quote, America has lost its capacity to determine the course of history alone, unquote. Here we could even ask subtly if America has ever really been able to determine the course of history alone. I don't think so. We should question critically and discuss our understanding of leadership. Is the concept of leadership behind those two newspapers articles still up to date? What is the difference between leading and dominating? Does it make sense to strive for supremacy? Are leadership and dominance still realistic concepts today? When looking at history books on the 20th century, the concept of leadership of individual nations, at least in Europe, does not seem to be a recipe for success, to put it mildly. History does not repeat itself, but we should learn our lessons from it. In Munich, Hillary Clinton just said, it's all about trust. In the future, our main task and biggest challenge for security policy will be to create trust in order to fork partnerships. I do not mean trusting blindly, but trusting on the basis of smart and sustainable networks. Europe, in particular, is a unique success story in history with regard to the effect of partnerships that bring about peace. Today, we must especially intensify our partnerships with those countries that are not member at NATO. There is not just the responsibility to protect, but also the responsibility while protecting and as we learn in these days, even the responsibility after protecting. One thing must be clear to us all. We cannot and must not allow to relapse into old patterns of mistrust. There is no reason for Russia to mistrust NATO or the West in general. Syria is not Libya. The missile defense system protects Europe and is not targeted against Russia. If there, if there was such mistrust, however, then it would best be solved by cooperation and not by self-isolation. With reference to Germany, both the concern about leadership and the fear of an insufficient leadership exist. Let me be clear. German security policy aims at extending sustainable partnerships successfully. And by the way, Leadership emerges from deeds and not from words. Today, there is almost no country that can solve its problems, especially global problems, alone. What is happening in other regions in the world has a direct impact to our security, our job market, and our prosperity, even in a big country such as the United States. National solo efforts have simply no effect when it comes to challenges such as terrorism, organized crime, cyber attacks, pandemics, and the financial crisis. And I'm sure that Per Steinberg uh, uh, elaborated it uh, out in, in his attitude. As a consequence, the limits between domestic Foreign and defense policies are well as other polit politics areas become indistinct. After all, this also applies to many areas of government action.
for example, to the issue of an effective regulation of the financial markets. In order to be successful in the long run, government action must therefore be even more preventive, cooperative, cooperative and multilateral than in the past. This may not seem as attractive as the demand on someone's strong national role. Moreover, building partnerships through multilateral cooperation is tedious, but it is a pro problem oriented approach and it also requires leadership, but joint leadership and not unilateral one. Sharing responsibilities does not necessarily translate into a loss of sovereignty. If done well, a decrease in nation state sovereignty goes hand in hand with an increase of multilateral sovereignty. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Europe should not be frightened of a new strategic reorientation of the United States of America. We have reason to be relaxed and to be confident. Old Europe is certainly old. But what is old in Europe? Our culture, for example. Our uh, long-standing legal tradition. Many years of experience in disputes and reconciliation between European nations. I'm proud of these old traditions. Europe may not be as exciting as HIP or some, as some other emerging economic boom regions. We probably are not sexy. <laughs> However, that makes a good partner in the long run. <laughs> Even, you got the message. <laughs> Even in real life, nobody remains exciting forever. The transatlantic partnership is more than the North Atlantic Alliance. Our transatlantic relations rest on a bedrock that consists of far more than just mutual interest. In a preferably trouble-free trade between our two economic areas. It is our common values and our common ideals, ideals of the American and French Revolution that connects us. It is the human rights laid down in the Virginia Declaration of Rights and the French Declaration of Human Rights. In detail, we may have and we can have and we should have different opinions. Why not? And we can discuss them. But it is civilizing achievement such as the rule of law, the separation of powers, and our standing of a democratic state that prevail even through times of tremendous change. And you will, no, you will find no area in the world where this is the case, as in Europe and in America. These achievements are nowhere else to be found in the world, not even in Asia. And they are the sound basis for the future, and this includes Germany, with all its responsibilities, not fearing its own strength. Thank you very much. some questions. And by the way, thank you very much for a very substantive speech. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions. I kind of regret that your wife isn't here because I'm sure she would have had something to say about the partnership thing. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, leave that, uh, we'll leave that one aside, shall we? And I'm sure uh, others have questions. One or two, uh, please say your well, name. True love is Jennifer. more than uh, only being sexy. Excellent. We will put that on record. <laughs> thank you so much for clearing that up. Sorry. Even uh, without a microphone, I think I can be understood. Are we good? I, my name is Bernd Jensen. I'm a private consultant. My question for you is, um, there was a couple of years ago the foundation of a uh, French-German joint battalion. Brigade. And the uh, question is, uh, what's happening to that? Is that continuing? Is that growing? And 
the other question is, would that be a general pattern for what is described as uh, a European uh, defense organization in, in, uh, within NATO? Okay, well, 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 the uh, German French Brigade is uh, good underway. They educate together, they have been educated together, they train together, but they have not been in mission together. On the other hand, we have uh, similar institutions with the Netherlands, with Poland, uh, Denmark, other countries. And there we have common missions and common goals abroad, even in Afghanistan. Um, and now we are, uh, Germany and French are on a, what we call strategic dialogue. And one result could be and should be a common concept of being together in missions, the German-French Brigade. Now, um, about the European army. As you remember, the whole story began with the European Defense Army. It failed. Not because of Germany, by the way. But now, times are gone. First of all, I would recommend you to read uh, the um, judgment of our um, high, also Bundesverfassungsgericht, constitutional. Uh, constitutional. There are very strict restrictions on building a European army. It's interesting. They will not be asked to do so, but they did. Sometimes judges do so. <laughs> Secondly, we are so much integrated in NATO, and this is so great benefit, such a great advantage. We work, we fight, we die shoulder on shoulder. There are the same methods to lead troops. We have such an exchange of personnel in all levels. By the way, sometimes this includes neutral countries in Afghanistan. Very much so. Why the hell should we separate that and build an, a European army? It's not necessary. We have European missions. For example, Atalanta and others. And they work well. Why not? Um, but the the damage of disintegration in NATO would be worse than the benefit of having an, a common European <coughs> army. This is my clear answer. Okay, one more question over there. Um, my talking. name is Nadia Kravitz. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here. Um, a question is, you refer to a neighborhood of Europe, and I would be curious to find out how you define this uh, neighborhood in which you see Europe's responsibility. And also, what kind of security concerns does Europe have in today's neighborhood? And perhaps related question to that, how does Russia fit in into your picture of neighborhood and its security concerns? Thank you. Good question. <laughs> um, first of all, the Balkans, for example, Kosovo. What, what are they? Neighbors of Europe? No. Part of Europe, yes. Neighbors of NATO, yes. There are American troops there. They are welcomed. But this should be our task in the foreseeable future. And I think it would be quite difficult for an American Secretary of Defense to persuade the American Congress to send troops in Kosovo. So this is our own, uh, what we called in uh, former times, Hinterhof. How would you translate Backyard. that? Huh? Backyard. Backyard. Now, other neighbors are um, the Mediter Mediterranean countries. There I see a growing responsibility for Europe, but not the only one. But 
common responsibilities. Um, this leads to uh, the role of Israel, the role of um, the uh, Middle East conflict, which is the source of a lot of con conflicts uh, in general. So this has to be done together. And then our eastern neighbors is not Russia. First of all, Ukraine, Belarus, and others. <coughs> this should be our responsibility to develop a foreign and a security policy towards them. That's difficult enough, by the way. Um, in Russia, of course, this is uh, Europe, to a certain extent. Um, but still, not only because the nuclear power of Russia, it always will be um, a common interest of Europe and the United States of America. Um, so, when I speak about more European res responsibility, then I would like to underline this does not mean automatically um, own resp al responsibility alone for Europe. But someone has to take the lead. And in the Balkans, for example, it's quite normal that Europe should take the lead. American help is helpful, not welcomed, but should not be the lead. And in other areas, it's the other way around. Um, and then I forgot the North. And we should not forget the North. I'm not talking now about the Baltic states. It's a different story. I'm talking about the high North. I was last year in Norway. I started my visit this week in, in Canada. And we will see strategic changes in the high North in the next 10 to 20 years. If the uh, ice is, melt, is melting, this could change the trades the international trade, extremely. And there are four countries there. Norway, Denmark, Russia, and Canada. Three of them are NATO members, and Russia. Norway thinks this could be a, a role for NATO. Canada thinks, my colleague just told me, it's not a responsibility for NATO, the high north. But in the end, there are common interests, at least to supervise what's going on there. And they have security and safety issues to doing so. So this is of common responsibility. Europe has to play a role there, America as well. So if you see our neighbors, it depends where you look and where the situation is. All right, okay. thank you very much. Uh, let me all ask you to help me thank the minister for her speech, which I thought was very useful. Um, I'm sure will lead to lots of questions on the panel, which we will now segue into without a pause. Thank you very much. Minister, that is you. Francisca? Yeah? Francisca. Und du bist hier und ich bin die Mitte. Und Herr Löser, genau. Super.